coffee is always required before wrap-ups. Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany and welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to do my September wrap-up, but before we get into that I did want to address the rebranding and renaming of my channel. I will be talking about it more in detail in a vlog that will likely be posted on Friday or Saturday depending on when I get all of the content edited, but basically I decided to go ahead and rebrand my channel to be more in line with some of my priorities and passions and a direction that my life is taking with regard to to animal care and welfare. Again, I will definitely be going more in detail in that vlog in the very first few minutes of that vlog, but basically I'm now going for a second undergraduate degree and this one will be focusing entirely on animal health and behavior. And my goal is to eventually use that degree to work with animals in some capacity. Y'all know that I am a huge animal advocate, animal lover, my own rescue for babies, feature heavily in my videos, particularly the vlogs. And as I continue down this path and as I work to get professional experience and eventually a job working with animals, I plan to document that. This will always be a booktube channel. My videos will always be book related, but I definitely will be featuring animals heavily on this channel as I get more into that journey in, in the vlogs and stuff like that. I don't think I'll make any formal videos about the process unless you actually want me to but like I said this is a booktube channel and I don't plan on that content changing. I just wanted this video to better reflect my biggest passions and priorities and those are rescues and reads. Animals and reads basically. Now that that's out of the way we're gonna go ahead and jump into the meat of the video. So I typically prefer to do mid-month and end-of-month wrap-ups where around the midway point I tell you what I've read thus far and then at the end of the month I wrap up the rest of the books. However since I obviously just came back and wasn't able to do a mid-month September wrap-up and because I actually read less in September than I normally do because I was on a two-week vacation. I felt like it wouldn't be too terrible to go ahead and do a full month wrap-up in one video. I promise I will try to be as brief and articulate as I possibly can. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. I read a total of eight books in the month of September and I'm going to talk about two at one time even though I didn't read them back to back in September but they do go together. The very first book that I read in the month of September was The Defense by Steve Cavanaugh. This is the first book in his Eddie Flynn series and then later on in the month I actually read The Plea which is book number two. If I had to describe these books in one sentence it would basically be high octane legal thrillers. In these books we are following Eddie Flynn who is a former con artist. He grew up learning how to be a con artist from his father and eventually he decides to go on the straight and narrow and become a defense attorney due to some great mentoring that he had. However, at the very start of this book, Eddie Flynn is no longer practicing law because about a year ago, something kind of traumatic happened to him in his law career that made him question his whole line of work. And so he's kind of down on his luck. He is not making very much money. He and his wife are on the outs and things become especially more dire when his daughter ends up being kidnapped by the Russian mob. And they kidnap his daughter because they actually want to force Eddie into working for them and representing the leader of the Russian mob who has been arrested and charged of terrible crimes. Now, of course, throughout the book, you are finding out why exactly the Russian mob wanted Eddie Flynn personally to be their representative. And you are also uncovering a lot of secrets. It is very, very fast paced. It takes place over maybe, I wanna say 30, 36 hours. It is very, very clever, intricately woven, complex, and it's very engaging. Normally, I'm not a very big fan of these high octane fast paced books because I'm a character driven reader. So in order for me to connect with the books, I really like that character development, the complex character dynamics. That is what I really need. That is what gets me to sink my teeth into a book. However, I found the defense and then also the plea to be so engaging and page turning that it didn't necessarily bother me as much. I felt like I got a lot out of these books because they were actually quite substantial just in their complexity. I believe Steve Cavanaugh may have some background in law, maybe even as a defense attorney, and he uses that to create these very complicated storylines with a lot of different interwoven threads that go through that you have to really pay attention or you're going to miss. And he makes Eddie Flynn such a smart, clever character that's able to use his con artist skills to really help him in his work as a defense attorney. The plea kind of follows a similar structure. At the very beginning of this, Eddie has decided to actually go back and return to being a defense attorney. He feels like he can help a lot of people. He's working to rebuild that relationship with his wife and he's also working to help his daughter who is fairly traumatized from the events of the first book. But in the second book now, he is actually almost blackmailed into helping the CIA 
with the situation that they are currently in. So at the start of this book, a wealthy young man, kind of a Mark Zuckerberg-esque type of character, has been arrested for killing his girlfriend. And what the CIA wants to do is they want to get in there and represent this client so that they can force him to take a plea and then hopefully by helping him, they will get him to turn on his law firm, who the CIA believes is very, very corrupt and is laundering huge amounts of money. And they want Eddie Flynn's help to do this. Now, a catch here is that Eddie Flynn's wife actually works for this law firm. And so in order to encourage Eddie to help, they basically say that they have something on his wife. And if he doesn't help, she's going to go to prison for a very, very long time. And then it goes from there. Again, this is another complex, very fast paced, intricately woven story, but it's just so page turning and engaging. And you want to keep going and you want to know what happens. And you want to see how Eddie is going to get out of this because that really is the fun. It's really seeing the legal maneuvering that's going on in these books. Really what I love to see in like courtroom dramas is just the back and forth between the prosecution and the defense. It really is who is smarter, who has the better skills, who can twist the evidence and make you see what they want you to see. And I really enjoy watching Eddie do that in the courtroom. It's basically an art. And so I really, really enjoyed both the defense and the plea. So I'm really interested to continue. I'm definitely intrigued enough and I've really, really been enjoying this series so far. So the defense was book one and the plea I believe was like book six. But book number two that I finished in the month of September was The Lost Girls of Willowbrook by Ellen Marie Wiseman. This is a historical fiction that is actually based on a real life sanatorium that existed. I believe it was on Staten Island. This was a very notorious sanatorium because it was actually revealed by investigative journalists the horrific conditions going on in the sanatorium. They were extremely over capacity in terms of their patient load and understaffed. These patients were being horribly neglected, oftentimes abused, and a lot of the patients there were mentally handicapped children. It was disgusting, disturbing, it was absolutely awful, and Ellen Marie Wiseman took that and made it an inspiration for her story. In this story, you're following Sage. And I believe, I want to say she's 16 or 17 at the time of this story. And she is living with her stepfather. Her father is out of the picture. Her mother has passed away and it is just her and her stepfather. And she has believed this entire time that her twin Rosemary is dead. She's believed that her twin Rosemary has been dead for the past six years. But one night she overhears her stepfather talking to a friend of his because he's just gotten a phone call from Willowbrook State School saying that Rosemary is missing. Now, naturally, Sage is very upset and angry and confused. She's thought her twin sister has been dead this whole time, but really she was sent and locked away to Willowbrook State School. So Sage takes it on herself to go and find Rosemary. But when she shows up at Willowbrook, she is mistaken for Rosemary and committed to the institution. And the book goes from there basically. She's trying to convince everybody that she's not her sister while still trying to find her sister. And it's about those struggles, also herself experiencing and witnessing the horrific abuses that go on in Willowbrook. On the outset, this book sounded absolutely fantastic, something that I really thought that I would enjoy. However, I felt the execution of this book was lacking. This was not an extremely long book. I think it was just over 300 pages. And I swear 200 of those pages were Sage saying the same thing over and over again. I am not Rosemary. I am Sage. I am Rosemary's twin sister. I came to find her after I found out that she was missing. I believe something has happened to her. You have to believe me, please. I am not my sister. Over and 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 over. Like constantly, this is what the book was. Her basically trying to convince people who were willfully not listening to her that she was not her sister. And I get that. Of course, if you're wrongfully imprisoned in this horrific sanatorium, you want to get out of this sanatorium. But obviously this wasn't getting her anywhere because they think that she's crazy. And I guess Rosemary, while she was in the sanatorium, was telling everybody that she was sage. Nobody was listening to her. And in fact, the level to which they weren't listening to her was almost comical, almost worthy of disbelief because Sage actually presents as a very capable, rational, competent, sane individual, but nobody was paying attention to her. Nobody was listening. I just found myself frustrated because I would like to have seen Sage take more action to find her sister than to spend so much of her energy repeating the same thing over and over to people who obviously weren't going to listen to her. But if she just found her sister, problem would be solved and that they would have to believe her. So overall, I really enjoyed the premise of the story. I liked the direction that it took, even though it was fairly predictable, but I found it very redundant. I found it very repetitive. And in the end, I just felt like more could have been done with 
with the story. So I believe I gave this like a 3.5 stars. I didn't hate it. I would definitely be willing to read more from Ellen Marie Wiseman in the future. I think this was probably like a me thing, not a her thing. This one just wasn't quite what I was hoping it would be. The next book that I read was Big Lies in a Small Town by Diane Chamberlain. I had read one book by Diane Chamberlain before. It was called Necessary Lies and I really enjoyed that and I knew that I wanted to pick up another book by her. This actually satisfied a prompt for the buzzword readathon and so I jumped on the chance to read another Diane Chamberlain and I really really enjoyed this. So this is a historical fiction that is set in two timelines. In the present day timeline you're following Morgan Christopher and she is in prison at the start of this story. She is in prison over a drunk driving incident that she wasn't technically responsible for but she took the blame anyway because she didn't want to get the person who was driving in trouble and so she's sitting in prison, been there for a year, she thinks that she has two more years on her sentence but one day two women come and help her get out of prison. One of the women is a lawyer and the other woman is the daughter of a very well-known respected artist who Morgan actually likes and this artist has recently passed away and when they were going through his will they saw that he has stipulated that he wants Morgan to be the one to restore this decades-old mural that he wanted to hang in the foyer of a gallery that he planned on opening. Only Morgan could do it and if Morgan was not able to restore the mural and get it up by the time of the gallery opening which had a very specific opening date there would be consequences to that. So Morgan is very very confused. She knows of this artist, she's a fan of this artist, but she has no idea how this artist knew of her, why this artist wanted her to be the one to restore the mural because before she was in prison she was an art student but she still knew nothing of restoration. She knows nothing of how to restore this mural and so she's completely baffled by this whole situation but she is released from prison, she is put on parole, she goes to live with the daughter of the artist, I believe her name was Lisa if I'm remembering correctly, and she gets to work and as she starts to restore the mural she starts to notice some funky things included in the mural that you wouldn't expect to see and it causes Morgan to be very very intrigued. It causes her to want to try to find out more about the artist who painted the mural. She starts to very deeply care for the artist and connect to the mural and that kind of leads us to the past timeline which takes place in 1939 and 1940 and you're following Anna Dale. She's an artist from New Jersey who won a national contest to paint a mural for a post office in rural Edenton, North Carolina. Now Anna Dale has never been to Edenton, North Carolina. She knows nothing of this town but she's feeling a little bit lost because her mother just passed away and so she figures that she will go to Edenton, North Carolina for a while to get a feel for the town, start to uncover what the town is really about so that she can paint this mural. But when she gets to the town she finds that this is a town with deeply held prejudices, secrets, they don't really want her there, they think she's an outsider that can't possibly do the job justice. And so even though she's set up and she's doing great work on the mural she finds herself running into some challenges. And you're following her as she is painting this mural and what she is facing while doing so and what actually happened to her because the mural was never quite finished. It never got hung in the post office and Annadale up and disappeared. So in the present timeline you're following Morgan Christopher as she's trying to uncover what happened to Annadale. Did she go crazy like everybody said? Did she just up and abandon this project or was there something more to it? I very much enjoyed this. Yes it was a historical fiction but there were definitely tinges of mystery going on and I was captivated by both timelines. I enjoyed watching Annadale's journey as she gets to this town, starts to meet the people, starts encountering these challenges while she's painting the mural and everything that goes along with that. And then you're following Morgan as she's trying to figure out the mystery for herself in the present and all of the things that she herself is trying to overcome personally. I felt that this was a very solid story. It was very charming in its own right and I will definitely be reading more from Diane Chamberlain in the future. Next I read Defy the Night by Bridget Kemmerer. This is the start of a new fantasy series and I really really enjoyed this. This book is set in a kingdom where a sickness is ravaging the land and and the only known cure for the sickness are these moon petal flowers that are only found in two of the sectors of this kingdom and because of that they are highly politicized. Obviously the leaders of these sectors know that they have some power and control because they are the only sectors that have this moon petal flower that will cure the people and so they are trying to control the flow. Meanwhile you have the actual king trying to do what is right by his people, trying to keep peace, trying to keep people well, and trying to prevent rebellion from happening. However for people like Tessa Cade that is not enough. She doesn't feel like the king is doing enough to help the people and so she and her friend Wes are actually kind of like outlaws and they are constantly breaking into the royal sector, stealing moon petal flowers and distributing it to those who are sick and in need of it. They are definitely risking their lives every day to help their people but 
of course, as you would expect, one day it catches up to them. And after a brutal act by the king's justice, Tessa has had enough. And so she decides to break into the palace to see if she can do something about it. And it kind of goes from there. This is actually told in two perspectives. You're seeing Tessa's perspective. And then you're also seeing the perspective of the king's justice, Prince Coric, who is the brother of the king. And you're seeing his own personal struggles because as the king's justice, he's got to be this ruthless, vicious creature. He is literally the hand of justice. And he and the king are desperately trying to make examples of the people who are stealing moon petal flowers because they want everything to be fair. They want a fair amount of rations of these moon petal flowers to go out to all of the sectors. But like I said, it's not enough and rebellion is brewing. And so you're seeing Prince Cork as he's struggling to be this person that his brother needs him to be, this horrible, terrible King's Justice whom everybody hates. But obviously there's more to Prince Cork than just that. There is a deeper level to him that doesn't enjoy doing what he's doing, who wants to help his people more. And so you're seeing that, you're seeing Tessa's point of view, and you're seeing what happens when the two of them come together after Tessa breaks into the palace. I thought that this was such a solid book, such a solid start to a series. I very much enjoyed it. It was definitely compulsively readable, very easy to follow, easy to understand. I definitely want to see what happens with Tessa and Prince Cork in future books. I think it's going to be wonderful. I love Bridget Kemmerer. I read two of her contemporaries, and then I read the first two books in the A Curse of Dark and Lonely series, which I definitely need to finish, but I'm kind of nervous about it, to be honest. But I just, I love Bridget Kemmerer. She is a solid, solid author, no matter if she's writing contemporary or fantasy. I will probably read anything that she ever writes. So if you are looking for a new young adult-ish fantasy to jump into, I would definitely recommend this one. Next, I finished As Good As Dead by Holly Jackson. This is the third and final book in a Good Girl's Guide to Murder series. So I obviously can't really say much about this because I don't want to risk spoilers. But if you're not familiar with what this series is, it is a young adult mystery thriller series. You're following our main character, Pippa Fitzamobi, who in the very first book, for a school like capstone project, she decides to reinvestigate a crime that happened several years earlier to a former high school student named Andy Bell, who was brutally killed. And they thought that her boyfriend, Sal Singh, was the perpetrator and Sal Singh ended up dead as well. I believe he killed himself. But Pip is not convinced that that is what happens. And so she begins her own journey to uncover what happens with the crime and she enlists the help of Sal's brother, Ravi. And so it is them and their journey to uncover the truth of what actually happened to Andy Bell. And so naturally there are a lot of key players. A lot of secrets are uncovered. Twists and turns abound in the very first book. And I thought that it was so well done. You don't necessarily see a lot of young adult mystery thrillers done so well. Holly Jackson obviously knows her stuff. Holly Jackson is obviously deeply meshed in the true crime murder mystery thriller world. She did such a fantastic job. In book number two, Pip actually creates a podcast of her experiences in the first book, but some additional things start to happen from the first book and things escalate. It gets a little bit darker and all of it culminates in book number three. You definitely want to read these books in order because you will absolutely miss things if you don't. There are things coming out in book number three that pertain to book number one, even though you think kind of book number one is done and over, it is not. Things are consistently revealed in book two and three that influence the events in book number one. Now, I will say that for the first like 40 or 50% of this book, I thought that this was headed to be like one of my favorites of the series. However, the second half of this book took a turn I was not expecting and it went into a direction that I didn't feel was consistent with Pippa and Ravi's characters. If you've read this book, and you know what happens, you may be able to understand what I'm talking about. I felt like there were a couple of other different directions it could have or should have taken, not the direction that it did take. Was it still clever and solid and well thought out and well done? Absolutely, I'm not going to deny that at all. But I thought that this was just a little bit too off kilter for the characters of Pip and Ravi. But overall, still very solid, still a great ending to the series. I will definitely read anything that Holly Jackson writes. I believe she has a new release coming out next year and I am all here for it. I gave it a 3.5 stars, but I didn't, I didn't hate it. It just didn't go in the direction that I thought that it should or wanted it to go. And like I said, I felt like it was definitely different than what I would have expected from their characters. So again, 3.5 stars, not terrible. Overall, a very well done series and I do still highly recommend. Okay, so after I finished that, that is when I read the plea. And since I've already talked about that, we're going to go ahead and jump into A Faint Cold Fear by Karen Slaughter. This is the third in her Grant County series. Now, y'all know that I am a huge fangirl for Karen Slaughter, particularly her standalones. She is almost unmatched in her brutality and gruesomeness. Karen Slaughter goes there. She is not afraid. I love her darkness. But I haven't loved the first two books in the Grant County series. Now, granted, these were her very first books ever. I believe. So I'm cutting her a little bit of slack, but they just weren't 
what I've come to know and love from Karen Slaughter and the first book I found was very very predictable so it wasn't the best but I did want to finish this series because basically I want to read her entire backlist and also I know that it eventually butts into the Will Trent series which gets a lot of praise and I don't want to start the Will Trent series until I finished this series so I definitely wanted to continue and I actually really enjoyed the third installment this was absolutely the strongest of the series so far in my opinion I really enjoyed the storyline overall if you're not familiar with what this series is it follows our main character Sarah Linton and she is from a small area in Georgia called Grant County and because of its small nature she not only is the town's pediatrician but she is also their coroner and so she is often called out on crime scenes which are overseen by Jeffrey Tolliver who just happens to be Sarah's ex-husband. Jeffrey cheated on her they got divorced and now they're kind of trying to work through some of their problems and so you're seeing that kind of progress throughout the series as well. But in this book Sarah and Jeffrey are called to the scene of what looks like a suicide. However Sarah ends up bringing her pregnant sister to this crime scene. They were enjoying some girl time together when she got called to the scene and Sarah's sister was okay with going. She didn't want Sarah to go out of her way to drop her off before headed to the crime scene. However Sarah's sister wanders off to use the bathroom and she is brutally attacked and so that actually leads Sarah and Jeffrey to believe that there might be more to this kid's death than an actual suicide and it goes from there and it follows Sarah as she's trying to deal with what's happening to her sister while also still doing her job. She still has to do the autopsy on the victim to determine what happened and then you're following Jeffrey as he's trying to uncover what happens and then more deaths start to occur. More suicides which is very unusual for this this small college area. Again I thought this was very solid. This was definitely the best one in the series so far. I felt like it was less predictable than the first book. Still somewhat predictable. Like I think you can kind of see what's coming in terms of who the perpetrator is but not necessarily his motivations. Like I thought the way that that was revealed and the journey we take to get there was pretty well done as well. So I'm thrilled that I enjoyed this one. I did not want to go through this book thinking that they were all like two or three star reads. I gave this one solid four stars and I am happy to continue now. In fact like I'm kind of in the mood to continue but we've got a TBR we've got to stick to so overall very very solid like I said four stars love Karen Slaughter if you have not picked her up if you like dark disturbing gruesome mystery thrillers you cannot go wrong with Karen Slaughter and then the very last book that I read for the month of September kind of ending on a little bit of a lower note we have The Golden Couple by Sarah Pacannon and Greer Hendricks I consider myself a fan of this duo I really loved The Wife Between Us I thought that that was so well done I loved the plot twist that came in the middle of the book and I have enjoyed the other I think it's two books that I read by them they weren't as good as The Wife Between Us but still very propulsive very engaging compelling you want to turn the page you want to find out what happens this was very underwhelming so this follows two perspectives you're following Avery who is a therapist who has actually lost her license because of her unconventional therapeutic methods she's got this revolutionary like 10 session system where she believes she can like fix you in 10 sessions so she's very well known very highly sought after even though she has lost her license but people still want to go to her because they believe her methods work and then you are following Marissa and Matthew Bishop who are the golden couple and Avery's clients of note for this book so the reason why Marissa has sought counseling from Avery is because she needs to let Matthew know that she has been unfaithful so she lets Matthew know and then it goes from there as Matthew has to deal with the consequences of Marissa's unfaithfulness and Avery is going to use her revolutionary 10 session system to help fix their marriage. However, Avery knows that there are still secrets that are not being told. Marissa is definitely hiding a lot and Matthew is too. So Avery is using her unconventional methods to uncover the truth and she finds that she is connected to Marissa and Matthew in an unexpected way. So I would say that overall this was just very underwhelming. It honestly did not read like a suspense thriller at all. I mean I would say if anything it read a little bit more like a mystery because you know that there are secrets that everybody is hiding things and so you're going on the journey to uncover what is being hidden. It definitely does not read like a suspense thriller. It really doesn't. In fact while you're reading this for the most part nothing suspenseful or thrilling really happens at all to be honest with you. I was expecting Avery to be more of a complicated gray area type of almost villainous therapist if you will and she really she really wasn't. She was really overall a pretty decent person and I didn't necessarily mind that at all. In fact I thought it was kind of refreshing. The focus was really on the golden couple and what was going on with them and what they were hiding and I will also say that there were so many different little threads throughout this book different little side storylines that were happening that kind of took you out of everything trying to make you remember 
how everything was connected and trying to remember all of these threads so that you didn't drop one. And so when it was brought up again, you remembered, oh, this is why I need to care about that. And so it was just a lot. And by the time we get to the culmination, the climax of the book, if you will, I, I didn't really care. I didn't really think it was anything mind blowing or surprising. I wasn't all of that shocked by anything that happened at the end of this book. To be honest with you, I didn't love it. I gave it a three stars. It was very meh. I will probably forget everything about this book in like the next week. Will I still read more from this duo when they come out? Yes, absolutely I will because I've enjoyed their past works a lot, but this was just not what I was hoping for. And so it's probably my least favorite of their work so far. Again, three stars. All right, everyone. And that is it for my September wrap up. If you have read any of the books that I talked about today, please let me know what your thoughts were down below. I would love to hear. Please let me know what some of the best and worst books you read in September were. And as always, y'all, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. Be sure to click that bell icon so you will be notified anytime I post new videos and subscribe if you haven't already because I would sure love to see you in my next video. Bye guys.